Uh, I have a question. I don't know the answer. Maybe we'll uh, develop the answer as we go through this presentation. But why do we men generate millions of sperm when you only need one? Just one. And it's a question that uh, many have theorized. And no one has ever proved it. And I want to take you through not too much complicated chemistry, but what happens with this sperm when it's moved around, when it's transported, but more importantly, when it's reprocessed from a single circular cell into something that's moving. Now, if I got this right. Uh, we produce nanoparticles, submicron particles, and these particles are irregular. They're not circles. We can make circles. We don't want to make circles. You get better binding with irregular shaped particles to a cell, to a sperm cell, especially a moving target. Now remember the classical methods for selecting sperm it's like a, uh, who's got the best Ferrari? Which is the fastest? Which moves a along a straight line? And then, as Jen mentioned earlier, about under the hood. When you look under the hood of these sperm, you'll be able to see that there are deficiencies, particularly in DNA, that still allow that sperm to move like a Ferrari. So you could be selecting a fast-moving, straight-line sperm, that's deficient. Uh, we do this work with uh, laboratory magnets. And I'll show you at the end how this works, but all we're doing is mixing magnetic particles, and they're only magnetic when a magnet's near them. And those magnets, those little particles, submicron particles, identify certain markers on that sperm. <coughs> Now, what are the markers? I'll get into that in a few minutes or so. And the materials are safe, and I'll go through some of the safety work that we've done with a variety of animals. <clears throat> uh, we originally got the patent for MRI contrast agents. And essentially, the MRI contrast agents are what this material is fundamentally made of. So it's, it's safe. <clears throat> but <clears throat> what we decided to do our shop consists of chemists and engineers. Uh, we fix things, we make things. So we had to align ourselves with various universities to see how could we make materials that will specifically move and capture defective sperm. And we started out with the uh, University of Missouri, as it turns out. I'll get into the specifics of them. Because each one is a different species that we worked with. Uh, we have a collaborative agreement with Mississippi State University. Um, I spent two years at the request of the Yale Medical School setting up a laboratory so that we could look at cells, not sperm, but cells in general. And what we were determining is there's an extensive communication system within a cell. The outside of a cell could have thousands of markers thousands. And these markers are stimulated. Some are, some are active, some are inactive, and they change. So the communication that's taking place between these cells, or certain chemicals are released within the cell and between the cells. That's how they talk. Uh, we work with University of Texas Medical School. And let me get into the specifics because We got into, uh, at the University of Missouri, the animal group working on not only fertility selection, but also gender selection. As you know, if you could separate X from Y, particularly in the cattle industry, the more Xs or the more females, those female cows now are good for dairy products. If you could separate and isolate the Y sperm, those are good for cattle. So 
in general, what we started to do was to look at, can we get a mix, especially in the U.S., of a 60% sperm that was mostly female? And taking a female sperm, freeze it, because they put it in straws. Because the baseline in the U.S. is about 42%. So 42% of the bull sperm is X, female. But if you want to have dairy products, you need to boost that X contribution up. Uh, a lot of that work we did at the University of Missouri, we've worked with uh, stallions. Uh, a lot of the reasoning for using uh, artificial insemination with stallions is the contamination that takes place when these horses are in the field. We've done a considerable amount of work with pigs. As you know, there's a big movement taking place in Europe in which the animal rights people do not want to castrate male pigs. So they want to anesthetize them. And some companies now are not purchasing uh, <clears throat> pork products unless those pork products have been with anesthetized animals. In the uh, human fertility area, we've worked with uh, Yeshiva University. We've worked with some people in California. I'll get into all of that a little later. We've also worked with dolphins. Uh, again, there's a shortage of female dolphins. And people are concerned that the dolphin population will become extinct. And when I say, I mean, we're talking like 70, 30, 70% 70 of the dolphins that are born today are male. So they're trying to jack up or increase the female population. Uh, other animals, elephants. I mean, this, that's bucket chemistry, by the way. <laughs> I just want to impress upon you not what all these different stages are, but to just think about it. You're starting out with a spherical cell. And what you want to wind up with is something that's moving, that has energy, that's carrying a package of DNA. It's also carrying other types of materials with it. Through that process, you have fluids, materials entering into that cell, materials and fluids coming out of that cell. You've got activation taking place within that cell. You have thousands of different molecules taking place to reform a spherical cell into a sperm. Now we have learned through our university contacts as well as some of the uh, other organizations that we have worked with if a, if a sperm cell is having a problem, let's say it's a DNA issue, that DNA could virtually be in the, in the process of unfolding, unpacking. Uh, just to back up a second, remember DNA is wrapped around as a spool. If you take a spool of thread, that's what DNA is inside these sperm cells. And it's got 10,000 circles, 10,000 turns in that DNA, and it's, if you stretched it out, it would be two, three meters long. So you're trying to get that DNA, which is wound up in a spool, to ultimately go through this process, and then, at the moment of conception, unwind. So you see thousands of molecules, thousands of messages take place. So the first question I had was, why do we generate millions? We only need one. And I think it's because this is not a robotics type of assembly. This is all chemistry. And the environment, the way you have lived your life, and there are some people who are saying with ancestral tags associated with your DNA, that influences the whole process of that cell. And, and by the way, it takes five, five and a half weeks to make that cell. 
five and a half weeks. And we're looking for motility. Let me see what we got here next. As I said earlier, these, the surface of this cell <clears throat> has to take in chemical messages and chemicals. It has to reformulate, it has to rebundle, it has to put that DNA in a package in such a manner that it can be delivered to that egg. And by the way, you ever hear of a zinc spark? This is the latest that people are talking about these days. When that egg and that sperm meet, there's a flash of light. Call that a zinc spark. During that flash of light, a lot of that chemistry that was used to generate that cell gets erased. So you have writing and erasing taking place through that whole process. So you have pores, aquapores, in the sperm surface. You have calcium channels, ions moving in and out. You have protein gates. This is not a hermetically sealed cell. It's got activity taking place. If it encounters a toxic chemical, it upregulates. It sends up more sensors, but yet at the same time, it doesn't have a good immunological base to that cell, like other cells do. It also will downregulate. So think of this as a very active cell taking in, giving out, reacting, and responding while it's trying to carry a DNA package to be inserted into an egg. This is uh, the process. I, I had it out in words, but this is really what's happening. And this is the five-week span. So you're going from that, that germ cell to the Ferrari or the F-150, whichever you're driving. And that's what takes five weeks. So we look at the surface. When you get to this point, let me see, I think I got it on the next slide. Oops, yeah, here it is. If you look at the top of that sperm, the head, that area, that acrosomal area, when it makes contact with that sperm, and prior to making contact, there's an enzymatic reaction, like essentially warning that sperm, that something is going to happen. Well, that red part starts to break down as it penetrates the egg, and that nucleus with the DNA will start to unravel. And there's your 23 chromosomes. Now, if there's any damage to that acrosome in the beginning, all bets are off. If if you have your sample, take it to the doctor, he looks at it under the scope and it's moving very well, but you see a little damage in that acrosome, chances are that sperm's not gonna last very long <coughs> as an intact moiety. Now, <coughs> these cells, this is a, these cells are stripped down Ferraris. You don't have a lot of vesicles or internal organs in those cells. What you have essentially is a nucleus, a midpiece that's generating energy to move this tail so that that tail will move. Now the common thread between the sperm that we have here and all the other ones I talked about, the pigs and the cows and the elephants, it's a similar membrane around all of them. So the membrane is the same that's the membrane that surrounds it, not internally. But yet, you can't transplant a elephant sperm to a human, or a human to an elephant. That egg will reject it. So the chemistry tells them this is not compatible. The other thing that happens, you're gonna have that fast-moving, straight-line sperm, but something could be wrong with the DNA. And that DNA could possibly be translocated. It could be altered. 
could be short. It could not have the full complement of 23. In addition, there's a whole field today called epigenetics in which ancestral information is being transferred. Things that centuries ago you might have had in your epigenetics. And these are certain chemical markers that accompany the DNA. This is where I think the whole field of chemistry and sperm is going to be heading anyway, epigenetic markers. So the mitochondria, we target that. If we see there's a problem with the mitochondria, that is the cell might not have enough energy, we target it with these nanoparticles. If that acrosome is damaged, we target it. If we feel that membrane <coughs> has flipped or punctured, and sometimes that's a good indicator for DNA damage, we target it. And we mix these together, and then when we mix, mix them and add them to the uh, sperm solution, particles will adhere to the targeted portion, the magnet <coughs> pulls them out, and the residual solution or the supernatant with the good sperm is what you're going to select. And by the way, you could remove 50, 60 percent of the sperm. In the case of frozen sperm, um, the freezing, that's why I was surprised to hear with, with eggs, you don't run into the freezing problems that you do with sperm. When you freeze sperm, the dead sperm produce reactive oxygen. Those dead sperm are killing the good sperm. So the freezing process, besides the ice crystals and everything else, could kill easily 50%. We've worked with the sperm banks on this, <clears throat> trying to see whether or not we could preserve that population. <clears throat> Environmental factors. As I said to you, things are moving in and out of that sperm cell. That sperm is reforming, repopulating itself. But you also have the environment. You have a, a semen solution, which may have toxic materials in it, might have viruses in it. And if you've been exposed to heavy metals, that will affect you. So cigarette smoking, obesity. The obesity issue is the, uh, uh, what, what's the, the phrase that's used? <coughs> There's a phrase that's used The thrifty phenotype. The thrifty phenotype, as I said earlier, there's these chemical markers in epigenetics, and the sperm uh, carries these markers. The egg and the sperm at fertilization remembers these markers, and these markers may or may not be used in that generation for diabetes, obesity, but you're carrying it. So that's a brand new field. Much has to be done, but nonetheless, I, I want you to just remember that your environment also contributes, your lifestyle contributes to the activity that's taking place in that sperm. And I think that's it. I think that's, uh, if anybody has a question or so, I'd be happy to try to answer it. What you're there. Oh, <laughs> yeah. This, I thought these were going to be moving. Let me click on it. We ran out of gas. Okay. That's a, that's a good fit. You see the part? This is the particle. Well, you see the sperm moving around. Those are the particles that have the surface chemistry that are looking for those aberrant sperms. And you see how they're being attracted, not because of the magnet, but because of the chemistry that's on that particle that matches the defective chemistry that's on that sperm. And then when you place a magnet against this tube, you will draw all those defective sperms. Again, it's finished. Okay, any questions?
Yes, sir. What's the typical lifespan that the mitochondrion can sustain that sperm outside the work? I think sperm could last four or five days in, yeah. in a human, in a human. When they freeze it, it probably lasts 10 years, frozen. That's liquid nitrogen frozen. Did you have a question? No, you're just scratching your head? Okay. So I get back to the, the question. Why do we make so much sperm when you only need one? All right, thank you very much.